Well, welcome to Element Church. Would you guys stand and worship with us? guys may have a seat. Well, happy Father's Day, you guys. Good morning. Welcome to Element Church. My name is John Wilson. I'm the children's pastor here at Element, and I want to thank you for being with us here in service today. 
If you're a first time guest, I especially want to welcome you. When you came in, you should have received a connection card that looks like this. If you could, just sometime during the service, which today will be about 60 minutes long, take a couple minutes to fill the bottom part out with as much information as you feel comfortable giving us. Then after service, you can take that and drop it off in one of the giving boxes on your way out, or better yet, you can take it across the lobby to the living room. We've designed and set up the living room with you in mind so you can go there as a first-time guest to meet some volunteers who'd love to connect with you, answer any questions you have about Element Church, and give you a gift just as our way of saying thank you for being with us here this morning. Now, so summer, summer's upon us, so uh, a lot of you guys are probably planning vacation trips or camping trips or fishing trips, and that makes us excited about the opportunity that we have for mobile giving. Through the mobile push pay app, you can actually automate your giving. So on the weekends that you're not able to be here because you're out uh, having fun with your family, it enables you to continue to be faithful with your finances uh, by partnering with what God is doing in and through Element Church, even when you're not able to be here. So if you have any questions about the push pay app or the website, you can go into the lobby to the guest services desk where a volunteer can help you figure out how to use that. Um, if you came this morning prepared with, uh, to give through cash or check, you can uh, drop that off in one of the giving boxes, either at, uh, at the auditory, auditorium doors or in the lobby. And if you're a first-time guest, please do not feel obligated to give this morning. This is for those of us who call Element Church our home. I just have one quick announcement for you guys. You probably saw it on your way in. The Back to School Bash is coming up. We've got our booth and our banner in the lobby. At the Back to School Bash, we will be giving, uh, giving away 2,000 backpack bundles to students here in Laramie County. Those bundles include a, a new backpack, school supplies, and a new pair of New Balance tennis shoes. You can partner with us by purchasing one of these bundles for $30. Uh, if that sounds like something you'd like to get involved in, I'd encourage you to go to the booth where you can purchase one or more of those. Or if you'd like to just get involved with the Back to School Bash, a member of the outreach team will be there to, uh, to guide you in how you can get involved with the Back to School Bash. That's all I've got for you guys. So if you would stand again, and we'll continue singing. Change who I am 
I lift my eyes up, my help comes from the Lord, from you, Lord. And oh my God, He will not delay my refuge and strength always. I will.
in prayer, would you? Father in heaven, we thank you that in Jesus we find our strength. Everything we need is found in you, Lord. And so right now, Lord, no matter how we came into this room, whether we're watching online or right here in person, Lord, I pray that your presence, your name, your power would give us the strength that we need. Jesus, give us strength. Heavenly Father, also on this Father's Day, we thank you for being our Father, for providing for us all that we need. No matter what kind of dad we had on the earth, you are the perfect Heavenly Father. So Lord, on this Father's Day, I pray that you would honor every dad uh, who is here, Lord. I pray for those who are struggling today. Uh, Perhaps they have lost a dad or lost a child as a dad. Father's Day is a difficult day for them, Lord. Would you fill them up? Even as we sang, as that burden weighs on them, would you carry it for them and with them? Would you fill them with your strength, God, today? I pray that this day, for everyone, whether dad or not, would be a great, great day in you. God, we love you, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Well, the day was August 7th, 2003. It was my 29th birthday. So August 7th's coming up if you want to write that down. So uh, not only was it my birthday, though, but on that day, I received some news that I really didn't necessarily want to hear, but, but I soon realized it was news I needed to hear, and in the end, I was actually glad that it happened. You see, recently, uh, we had moved into a home that the church I worked for had purchased. That home was right across the street from the church, which was perfect because we had two little ones at home. Jonah, our oldest, was two years old. Mariah had just been born three months earlier. So if I needed to get home and help my wife with anything with the kids, I could quickly just cross the street from the church uh, over to home and, and help her out. Well, on this particular morning, on my birthday, I received a phone call from my wife, and all I heard on on the other end was chaos from my children. Mariah was screaming, my wife was in tears, and it wasn't the kind of tears like, oh no, something tragic happened, you need to get home. It was the kind of tears like, oh no, if you don't come home and help me with your kids, I will do something tragic to you kind of tears. If you're a dad, you know what those uh, tears are from from your wife. So through her tears, my wife informed me that just Mariah would not be satisfied with anything. She was stressed out from trying to get the house in order after recently moving in. And to top it all off, Jonah had taken a bottle of Sabrina's red nail polish and dumped it all over the white carpet in the church, in the home that our church owned. She was convinced that I was going to lose my job. We would have no place to live and no place to raise our little ones, which obviously is a tad overdramatic, but I'm smart enough not to tell her that in the moment. I reassured her, I'll be right home, babe, and I crossed the street. I went into the basement uh, entrance to our house. I thought, I'll stop by the basement bathroom, do my business, collect my thoughts before heading up into the chaos that was our home that day. But before I could even do what I went to the bathroom to do, I noticed that my wife left something on the bathroom counter that I don't think she intended to leave out. It was a pregnancy test. Not just a pregnancy test, but a recently used pregnancy test, which I thought was weird because why would we need that? We have a three-month-old at home, and the test was clearly positive. I panicked. I grabbed that pregnancy test. I marched right upstairs into the chaos. Mariah was screaming her head off. Jonah was running around the house like a madman. And my poor wife was on all fours on the floor, tears streaming down her face, trying to rub red nail polish out of the white carpet when me, being the kind, caring, sensitive, respectful husband that I am, I held out that test and I said, what is this? As if I had nothing to do with it, right? I was like, how did this, I mean, I know how it happened, but how did this happen? Is this real? And my wife's response said it all. She burst into tears. Yes, my wife, weeks after delivering our second child, uh, was pregnant with our third child. And what can I say? She can't keep her hands off me. So (laughs) can I get a witness up in here? Just kidding. 
10 months and 26 days after delivering our second child, Mariah, my wife delivered our third child, Michaela. Less than 11 months later, I call her my care bear, and I would not have it any other way. Now, you might be asking, what in the world does that have to do with this message? Absolutely nothing. It's Father's Day. I want to reminisce a little bit for you, right? No, you, you know me better than that. I actually feel like this story uh, that I just shared with you is, is kind of like the news Jesus gives us in the passage of Scripture we're going to read today in this third week of a sermon series we are calling The End of the World as We Know It. If you're new here, uh, my name is Jeff Manis. I'm the lead pastor here. And for everyone who is here, whether you're regular or new, whether you're joining us on a video screen somewhere or right here in the auditorium, I'm so glad that you're with us on this Father's Day. Uh, So happy Father's Day to all you dads uh, out there. Just a little warning for this message, okay? I wanted to start off with a humorous story, not only because it fits, but also because this message is going to be very, very heavy today. Very heavy. The, the words from Jesus that we are going to read is not something we necessarily want to hear, but I think by the end of the message, you'll realize it's something that we need to hear, and you'll actually be glad that you heard it. And that's how my story relates to this this message. I mean, can you imagine if Sabrina had hid the fact that she was pregnant until Michaela arrived? Like, talk about chaos, right, if she were to, to do that. E- even though I may not have been ready for the news that day, I soon realized it was news I needed to know as the man of the house. And because I knew ahead of time, by the time Michaela arrived, even though it was not something that we planned on, uh, we were fully prepared and ready for her arrival. And now, I cannot imagine not getting that news that day. I'm so, so glad I got that news that day. And after today, I think you'll be so, so glad that Jesus gives us the news that he's going to give us ahead of time as well. Even for those of you who don't believe in Jesus today, like if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, it is awesome, love it, that you are here And the fact that Jesus gives us this news we are about to read ahead of time is a sign of his wonderful, merciful, great love for us. He didn't have to give us any information at all about his return or the end of the world, but in his love for us, he actually tells us everything we need to know ahead of time. Not everything we want to know, right? But everything we need to know about his return and the end of the world, we have been told. So, so far in the series, uh, which by the way, if you've missed either of the first two Sundays, you want to get caught up, you can watch our sermons on our website, elementchurchwy.com, or listen to them on our podcast as well. You can download that. So far in the series, we saw Jesus warn us about the end of the world. He gave us some signs to look for. He told us not to panic when you see these things happening, but to continue trusting in our God who is in control in an ever-changing world. Then last week, we looked at specifically the return of Christ, that Jesus did not tell us when he would come back, just that he would. Then he gave us some very clear signs uh, of his return. In fact, Matthew 24, 32 and 33, Jesus is recorded saying this, now learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things, talking about the signs he already gave, you can know his return is very near, right at the door. So Jesus gives us some signs about his return. We looked at some of those Last week, he went on to say, Matthew 24, 42 through 44 says this, So you too must keep watch, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Understand this, if a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be, what's that word? Ready. Ready. Everyone say ready. ready. You must be ready All the time, for the Son of Man will come when least expected. So the big idea this week is the same one from last week. We're just continuing the conversation, so it's kind of a two-part sermon last week and this week. The big idea is on the screens if you want to write it down. Knowing when Christ returns 
is not as important as being ready for his return. Be great if he told us when, but he didn't. So knowing when is not as important as being ready for his return. And church, if we ever lose sight of being ready, we have lost sight of what really matters. If we ever lose sight of that, we have lost sight of what really matters. That yes, it's okay, it's great to study in times theology. In fact, we've been telling you about some books my grandpa wrote uh, that we are making uh, available at the Element Store. My grandpa, 97 years old, I've been telling you about him. Been studying, teaching, writing on in times theology for longer than I have been alive. He wrote a number of books. I think they are great to use for study. They're available for $12 out at the Element Store. Three different books, $12. They're not very long to read, but they are kind of in depth if you want to dive into end times, specifically Revelation, which we are not even talking about really in this series. And just understand if you buy these, uh, they are written from my grandpa's perspective and understanding of the end times. I would align pretty straightforward with my grandpa's theology of end times. But by all means, study end times theology. That's, that's great. I think it's okay to have opinions, even strong opinions, about how all of this will shake out. But Jesus didn't tell us when it would happen. He just told us that he would come back, he gave us some signs, and he repeatedly warns us to be ready for his return, to be ready for his return. So last week, we looked at the words of Jesus from Matthew 24, 23 through 31, where I believe he answers the question, what should I know to be ready? And we looked at some things to know to be ready for his return. Now, in the remaining part of Matthew 24, and then all of Matthew chapter 25, Jesus answers, I believe, the most important question of it all. These might be the strongest words of Jesus regarding his return. He answers the question, why should we be ready? So the big question for today is that, why should I be ready for Christ's return? The main scripture is Matthew 24, 45 through 51, and then all of Matthew 25. So we are reading lots of scripture today. Uh, it will all be on the screen, so if you just want to follow along there, that's fine. If you want to use your own Bible, that's great as well. And if you don't own a Bible, I'd love for you to read these words all on your own, and so please don't leave without a Bible. Ask for one at guest services before you go. We'll get you one uh, free of charge, no strings attached. We are, as I said, we are reading a lot of scripture probably way more scripture than we've ever read before. I think we might have set the record uh, for the most scripture on the screens in, in one sermon. So my goal is to make less comments than I normally would. That is my goal, by the way, to make less comments than I normally would and just let Jesus speak for himself. And I'll remind you, what we are about to read is heavy. It is not exciting. It is sobering at best, Okay. Like Jesus pulls no punches in his final words about his return. And remember, these are the words of Jesus. Matthew, one of the 12 disciples, an eyewitness to the life of Jesus, recorded Jesus using these words regarding his own return and why we should be ready. And church, we better pay attention. Better pay attention to what Jesus says. Okay? Matthew 24. We're going to start at verse 44 to catch kind of the tail end of what Jesus said here and then launch into why. So verse 44. You also must be ready all the time, he said, for the Son of Man will come when least expected. And now Jesus, in the remainder of Matthew 24 and all of Matthew 25, he goes into four parables, four stories explaining why we should be ready for his return. The first one is this. A faithful, sensible servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I tell you the truth. The master will put that servant in charge of all he owns. But what if the servant is evil and thinks, my master won't be back for a while. And he begins beating the other servants, partying and getting drunk. The master will return unannounced 
and unexpected, and he will cut the servant to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hello. Happy Father's Day, dads. Right? Like, everybody doing okay still? Doing good? Jesus does not mince words, does he? Holds nothing back in his explanation. He doesn't just tell us that we should be ready. He's trying to tell us why we should be ready. So now he goes on and starts another parable in Matthew 25, verse 1. This is a brand new parable. It says this, Then the kingdom of heaven, or literally my return, then my return will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. So apparently these bridesmaids were waiting for the groom to come. Which, by the way, does this sound familiar at all if you're a believer? What is Jesus called in the New Testament? He's called the groom. The groom. What is the church or what are Christians called in the New Testament? The bride of Christ. Okay? So these bridesmaids appear to be people who at least are professing to be waiting on the groom to come back. They are, in other words, waiting on Christ to return. They are expecting, these all ten bridesmaids are expecting to be taken with Jesus, with the groom, when he comes back and welcomed into the wedding feast. Which, by the way, this idea of a wedding feast is also repeated in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 7. Look at what it says, Revelation 19, 7. Let us be glad and rejoice, and let us give honor to him, that's the groom, Jesus. For the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb, and his bride has prepared herself. Other versions say literally, his bride has made herself ready. She's ready for the groom to come. So Jesus, now using this wedding feast illustration that is used all through the New Testament, Matthew 25, now continuing on with these ten bridesmaids, verse 2. Five of them were foolish, five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, so he's taken a while, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom's coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your olive oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, We don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were what? Ready. Those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch. For you do not know the day or hour of my return. It's heavy. Knowing when Christ returns is not as important as being ready for his return. So why should I be ready? Okay, give you a little heads up. This is my opinion, but I don't know how you miss it in what Jesus just said. Number one is this, there is no second chance. There's no second chance. Jesus said, there were ten bridesmaids waiting. Five were ready, five were not. The five who were ready were welcomed into the marriage feast and the door was locked. The five who were not ready, the master said, I don't even know you. I don't know you. Again, I told you this last week, I gave you a heads up. I'll say it again this week for the second time. This is my opinion, okay? And there are many, many people who love Jesus as much as me and disagree greatly with this opinion. But according to Scripture, as I read it, the only time you ever see Christians being taken or rescued from the earth 
is at the return of Christ, and that only happens one time. In Matthew 24 earlier, read it last week, Jesus tells us, He will appear in the sky, the trumpet will sound, the angels will be sent, those who died believing in Christ will rise first, then those who are still alive and who believe and who are ready will be taken to meet the Lord in the air and they will be with him forever. And here, in what we just read, as far as I can tell, Jesus appears to be warning us that not only is he coming back to take those who believe, but he's only coming one time. And if you are not ready, there is no second chance. The door will be locked. Now listen, say it again. I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm dead wrong. For the sake of people in my life who I love dearly and are not ready for the return of Christ, I pray I'm wrong. I pray there is a second chance. And if there's a second, I pray there's a third and a fourth and a fifth and a 500th chance to put their faith in Jesus because I want as many people as possible to enter into eternity with Jesus forever. I'm just not confident enough to bank my hope on a second chance. Jesus said the door will be locked. Which, by the way, we didn't read this part of Matthew. But Jesus uses the days of Noah as an example of how it will happen at the end. And only those who were already on the boat when the door shut were saved. And I promise you, when those floodwaters came, there was people pounding on that door. But the door was locked. So, knowing when Christ returns is not as important as being ready for his return. And according to Jesus, I just read you what he said, only those who are ready will be welcomed into the wedding feast. So why should I be ready? I believe there is no second chance. I hope there is. I just don't see it. Jesus now continues into more exciting news. Matthew 25, 14 through 15. You still good? Okay. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. So he's still talking about his return. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last. Dividing it in proportion to their abilities, he then left on his trip. For sake of time, I will tell you if you don't know, the servant who got five bags invested it, got five more. The servant with two Two bags, invested it, got two more. The servant with one bag was afraid, so he hid the money in the ground. Okay? Verse 19. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. So again, for sake of time, the servant with five gave the five back plus the five that he earned. The servant with two gave the two back to the master plus the two that he earned. And the master gave this encouragement, this words of, of affirmation to both the servants. He said this, The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. So they were rewarded. Okay? But the servant with one, look what happens. Verse 24. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you did not cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I did not cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from the servant and give it to the one with the ten bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now... 
throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hmm. Aren't you glad you came today? Why should I be ready for the return of Christ? Well, I believe there's no second chance. Number two is this. The accounts will be settled. The accounts will be settled. Jesus said the master returned and asked the servants to give an account of how they used what they had been given. Remember, okay, this is important. Jesus was telling this parable in direct connection to his own return. I think sometimes we fail to talk about that when using this parable. Like in the church, we are great at using this parable to teach truths and principles on stewardship. And yes, there are great truths and amazing principles here concerning stewardship on how we use what God has given us with our time, our talents, and our treasure. But to only use this passage as a teaching on stewardship and never connect it with the return of Christ is missing the full power of the story. Jesus was using it to talk about his return. And in reading what Jesus said, you might be thinking, man, Jesus sounds so mean. This is not the meek, mild mannered Jesus I'm used to hearing about. I mean, so far, we're not even done yet. And so far, the first servant, he said, cut him to pieces. The bridesmaid said, I don't even know you. And this servant said, he's wicked, lazy, and useless. Throw him out into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Like he sounds so mean. So please understand, okay? Jesus is choosing his words very carefully here. He never spoke something he did not intend to speak. And in saying these things, he wasn't using strong language to be controversial. Jesus was not trying to be rude. He was desperately trying to convince us to be ready. If anyone wants us to be ready, it's Jesus. He paid the ultimate price to make us ready. And he's begging us to be ready. For his return, knowing when Christ returns. Not as important as being ready. So, what should I know to be ready? Well, I believe there is no second chance. I believe in some form or fashion the accounts will be settled. Number three, there will be a separation. There'll be a separation. Matthew 25, 31 through 46. These are the last words about his return. That Jesus gives. It says this, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory, he's not even hiding it this time, when I come back and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we do all that? And actually in the scripture, they repeat everything Jesus just said. When do we do all of it? And the king will say, verse 40, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry, you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger, you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked, you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison, you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you and not help you? And they repeat in the scripture everything he said. And he will answer, verse 45, 
I tell you the truth, when you refused to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. Knowing when Christ returns after reading these words is not nearly as important as being ready. So why should I be ready? Well, again, as I see it, I don't know exactly how it all works, but according to the words of Jesus, there is no second chance. He will come, those who are ready will enter the marriage feast, and the door will be locked. The accounts will be settled that we will each give an account for what we've done with what God's given us, and there will be a separation. That for eternity, the sheep, those who believe, will be with Jesus. The goats, those who do not, will be separated forever. This is why, by the way, I started this whole series by saying the end of the world may not happen tomorrow, but the way I live because of it should change today. Like what we just read, church, I don't care how long you've been following Jesus, that should make us pay attention. That Jesus is coming back. And he's coming for those who are waiting for him, who are ready for him. And I don't know how it all shakes out, but Jesus did not leave us in the dark. For all of us who just read these words, we will not be able to stand before Jesus and say, you never told me. You've heard. And because if you heard, now you're accountable for what you know. I've been wrestling all week long how to close this message. I typically work very hard on landing the plane. <laughs> I don't know how to land this plane. We're going to circle for a while. I'm very careful about offering invitations when it, it's easy to scare people into heaven. I don't want to scare you into heaven. I want Jesus to love you into a relationship. Fear will only keep you dedicated for about three days. The love of Christ can keep you faithful for a lifetime. And so as I've done the last couple of weeks, I'm just going to do it again today. If you're here and this message has sparked within you a desire to know more about the love, mercy, grace, and salvation of Jesus, that Jesus, God in the flesh, came as one of us, died because of us, rose victorious, so that any one of us could put our faith in him, be forgiven of our sins, given a new life today, and eternal life forever in heaven with him. That's real. It's called the good news, the gospel. If you want to talk to someone about that, please find me in the lobby. If, if you have to wait, please wait. I don't want you to leave without talking to somebody about this, okay? You can talk to me. You can find any of our volunteers and ask them. If they can't help you, they'll get you to somebody who can. You can stop by the purple tent in the back of the auditorium and, and talk to a prayer team member. They'll love to talk to you about what it means that Jesus died in your place, okay? So please find us if you need to talk about that for all of us. I just think a brief moment of reflection is due. Like, we can't just read what we read and walk out here as if nothing happened. What we read is why I'm so passionate about reaching more people. Because what Jesus said will happen. And if we don't join him in his mission to reach more people, they will hear, I did not know you. I don't want that blood on my hands. So we as a church will do everything we can to reach as many people possible so that they too can join us in heaven. Amen?
we can't keep it to ourselves, okay? So let's take a, just a brief moment, and I, just whatever you feel that you got to talk to God about, just do that. All right, next week, last week of the series, and it's going to be uplifting next week, okay? promise you. Super encouraging stuff I'm sharing next week. In fact, next Sunday, I'm sharing some new information about something our church is getting ready to do that is absolutely unbelievable. It's a dream come true for me and for our church. I can't wait to share it with you next week. So if you want to hear it first, uh, be here next week. And we'll conclude this series. Let me pray for you. And then remain seated. Got two quick things to close out. God, thanks so much for being a great God. Lord, thank you that you don't leave us in the dark. You're so clear. Lord, help us pay attention. Help us be ready. Give us faith to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're new, love to see you in the living room following the service. Don't forget, backpack bundles are for sale. Back to School Bash coming up August 18th. Love for you to partner with us in that. We're going to give away 2,000 of them, and you have a great opportunity to impact your city uh, by buying a backpack bundle out there. So that's all I got. Love you guys. Thanks for hanging in there. Have an awesome week. Happy Father's Day.